10, 9, 8. 81.7 seconds after launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on January 16, 2003, a dinner plate sized piece of insulating foam tore off the Space Shuttle Columbia's orange external tank and impacted the leading edge of the orbiter's left wing at a relative velocity of 545 miles per hour. The energy from the impact was enough to shatter the orbiter's thermal protection system, damage that would later allow superheated atmospheric gases to penetrate the vehicle during re entry. The entire sequence was caught on camera in slow motion yet NASA's debris assessment team failed to adequately identify the danger. But what if NASA had conducted an in-orbit inspection of the Columbia and determined that it was impossible to get the craft back to Earth? In a final report on the accident, released in August of 2003, a section titled STS-107 In-Flight Options Assessment laid out a startling possibility. The space shuttle Atlantis was already undergoing pre-flight checks for a mission to follow two months after the Columbia launch. Could the Atlantis have been sent on a rescue mission in time? It would have been a daring attempt, one never tried before, and one racing against the clock to reach the crew of the Columbia before they ran out of air. The Second Shuttle Disaster On February 1st, 2003, the ill-fated Columbia Space Shuttle Orbiter and its seven-person crew ended in disaster. On its journey back to Earth, the shuttle broke apart. Famous footage from the time shows the fiery debris shooting high up across the sky as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Wreckage of the space vehicle was strewn across eastern Texas and western Louisiana. This was the second shuttle disaster that NASA had to deal with, some 17 years after the first. The explosion of the Challenger space shuttle, just 73 seconds after its liftoff from Cape Canaveral on January 28, 1986, provided some of the most iconic images of the 20th century. The Columbia disaster of 2003 may have been somewhat less infamous in terms of global publicity, but no less shocking. It was a bitter and expensive failure for NASA. How Columbia Disintegrated The Columbia Accident Investigation Board, or CAIB, would ultimately identify the physical cause of the disaster as damage to Columbia's left wing. The damage had occurred just 81.9 seconds after launch. A small block of insulating foam had separated from the left ramp that connected the shuttle's fuel tank to the orbiter itself. It was then tumbling as the shuttle shook and violently climbed into orbit. The foam crashed against the leading edge of Columbia's left wing, gouging a hole in the shuttle's carbon heat shield tiles. The piece of foam became known as the Flight Day 2 object. NASA scientists ultimately calculated that it punctured a hole of roughly 16 inches in diameter in the panel. This was more than large enough, as analysts would later estimate that a hole as small as 10 inches across could have destroyed the shuttle on its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. It was only upon its re-entry on day 16 of the mission that the flight controllers monitoring Columbia's descent from Houston noticed erratic telemetry readings from the shuttle. The mission controllers hoped it was just a series of malfunctions on their side, but suddenly all voice and data contact with the shuttle was lost. Finally, re-entry flight director Leroy Kane gave the devastating order to everyone at mission control. Lock the doors. Those chilling words had only been uttered once before, 17 years earlier when Challenger exploded just after launch. It's what NASA refers to as LOCV, or loss of crew and vehicle. The worst had happened. A second time. What if the Day 2 object had been detected? The foam debris known as the Day 2 object remained unrecognized by the Air Force Space Command, or AFSPC, during Columbia's 16-day mission. There wasn't any perceived threat until atmospheric entry, which made it impossible to address the issue while in orbit. But what if NASA had detected the threat? Would NASA have been able to somehow save the crew? That was the exact question that the Columbia Accident Investigation Board posed. The CAIB asked NASA to develop a theoretical repair and rescue plan for Columbia based on the big what if. That is, what if the detached foam debris and the extreme danger had been detected early in the mission? NASA set about answering that question by laying out a comprehensive plan to rescue Columbia, set to appear at the end of the CAIB report as Appendix D-13. The Fortuitous Other Shuttle the plan to rescue the crew of the Columbia may have been possible due to one important fact at the time. While Columbia was still in orbit, the Atlantis shuttle was already undergoing preparation for flight. It was scheduled to launch on March 1, 2003, only a few weeks later. Atlantis was stationed at the Kennedy Space Center in the Orbital Processing Facility 1, designated OPF-1. Its three main engines had already been installed, but it didn't yet have a payload or remote manipulator arm in its cargo bay. NASA needed two more weeks of refurbishment and prep work on Atlantis before securing a pair of rocket boosters and a tank onto it. 
Ensuring that a shuttle is ready to launch is an incredibly complicated procedure that involves millions of highly technical, often minuscule steps. Pulling the launch of Atlantis forward would have meant deciding which steps to skip without endangering the rescue crew. Furthermore, fueling would have become more hazardous and equipment less thoroughly checked. Work shifts would become much longer and tougher on personnel, which in turn could lead to fatigue and procedural oversights that could potentially have catastrophic consequences. The Theoretical Plan to Rescue Columbia For the rescue plan, NASA planners realized that the most pressing supply issue for the astronauts was running out of suitable air as their cabin began to become too saturated with carbon dioxide. Due to stringent weight considerations on board any space vehicle, so-called spare air is limited. The space shuttle carries supplies of liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen, which convert into gas and get cycled into the cabin's air to maintain the needed 78% nitrogen to 21% oxygen mixture. To achieve a breathable atmosphere, exhaled carbon dioxide must be removed from the cabin. For this reason, air inside the shuttle is filtered through canisters filled with lithium hydroxide to achieve this. Columbia was equipped with 69 of these canisters, which meant enough clean air until flight day 30 of the mission, or February 15th. The timeline-related pressure for getting the Atlantis rescue mission absolutely spot-on would have been immense. This would have equated to unrelenting, brutal weeks of 24-7 shift work for everyone involved at Kennedy Space Center, with no margin for error. Adding to the theoretical pressure, there would be no practice countdown for the astronauts chosen to fly the mission, nor would there be extra fuel leak tests. The docking of Atlantis with Columbia would itself have prevented myriad challenges. To achieve docking, Columbia would have to be oriented tail-first and upside-down relative to the Earth, and Atlantis would have to approach right-side-up beneath it. Atlantis would then swing slowly up into place. The rescue shuttle would have to ease to a halt 20 feet from Columbia. Atlantis would be positioned at 90 degrees to Columbia, which would keep the vertical stabilizers of both shuttles from hitting each other. The mission control logistics necessary to achieve all of this would have been immense, since they would have represented the first time two space shuttles were simultaneously orbiting. That would demand two separate mission controls on Earth running cohesively and simultaneously. And what about the crew? Since there were already seven astronauts on Columbia, a maximum of only four astronauts could therefore be allotted to Atlantis. After all, the latter shuttle would have to accommodate all the astronauts back home. Yet despite all these gargantuan what-ifs, NASA believed it could be achieved. Final Consideration to the Rescue Plan the final report also considered if Columbia had docked with the International Space Station, which was already in low orbit at the time, and would have had more than enough space and food on board to accommodate the stricken shuttle's crew. Unfortunately, this was not feasible, due to what is known in orbital mechanics as a plane change maneuver. This shift in orbital direction would have required that Columbia apply thrust to shift, seeking to match the inclination of the ISS. The energy required just to execute that maneuver would be too great, and Columbia didn't have enough fuel. Finally, there was an important assumption that Appendix D-13 in the CIIB report did not address. If Columbia was so catastrophically disabled by a foam strike, then what would have been the contingency plan for Atlantis should the same have happened to it as well? As the CIIB report somberly concludes, quote, It is important to note at the outset that Columbia broke up during a phase of flight that, given the current design of the orbiter, offered no possibility of crew survival. Worst Case Scenario Planning for every worst-case scenario conceivable is what the people at NASA are all about. Leroy Kane, the NASA flight director on duty when Columbia was lost, clearly made this point when he said that, quote, what ifing is still an integral and very serious part of preparation for any space mission the agency undertakes. Kane would state that, quote, we went through many difficult failures and tried out many recovery procedures and training, and that prepared us to react constructively to a real crisis. He even added that, quote, in hindsight, we now know that many of the things we did were futile. On a different day, they wouldn't have been. The CAIB Report The rescue plan aside, the CAIB Report made damning critiques of NASA's pre-launch and post-launch decision-making. It condemned the hierarchical and territorial nature at NASA. It wasn't the first time NASA had been criticized for this. The same condemnations had occurred in the aftermath of the Challenger disaster. Nevertheless, Appendix D-13 of the CAIB Report into the destruction of the Columbia Space Shuttle is a well-informed and meticulously researched exercise in what if. Although pure speculation, it was compiled by engineers and scientists who are intimately familiar with the shuttle program. However, the same CIIB report still concluded that those seven astronauts aboard Columbia were almost certainly doomed from the moment that the foam block dislodged itself. A rescue plan to save the crew 
may have been nothing more than an elaborate pipe dream. 